Hi. We, we've asked a couple of times, and we're not going to force you and not put a whole bunch of peer pressure, so I won't even look up there, but we would love the cozy, coziness of coming towards the front. Um, this is our first art lecture in spring quarter, and um, we honored day of absence on week two, so week four today we have, I'm going to go through who's coming up this quarter. It's a pretty busy and exciting schedule. Today we have Margot Kwan Knight. Um, in week five, next week, we have Greg Horowitz, who's um, a scholar in philosophy of art and aesthetics. Uh, week six is Jordan Abel. He's a Nisa poet, an editor and writer. Week eight, we have Don Cerny, who's a two and 3D visual artist and who has a, an exhibit up at the Henry Art Gallery right now. And this Thursday, tomorrow, is giving a performance at the Henry. Week nine, we have Meehan Christ coming in from New York. She, or maybe, actually, yeah, New York. Writer in residence in the biological sciences at Columbia. So, and then potentially week 10, a pachakacha of graduating students across the board who attend the lecture series, um, which is this crazy, like, speed dial through a project, but there's something really nice about it. It's not, um, it, it gives you a sense of what, what someone has been working on without too much depth, but also um, it's fresh because it has to be so fast, so it's not polished, and there's something really nice about that. So if you're interested, let me know, because um, that, it will happen if, depending on how much interest there is. Um, I also want to always um, begin the series by thanking the people that are invisible that make this, that put this work together. Um, electronic Media does a really beautiful job with the recording. We now have some of the best recordings of lectures that I'm seeing on the internet from various schools um, and institutions across the country. We just really find quality and that they are made up of Raul Berman, Ben Hargett, Dave Crampton, and many others, plus the student interns who do a lot of the work. Um, Julie Ron is the person who is, she's one of the program secretaries, but she helps email the artist with these beautiful instructions and warm welcoming and lots of details for people to get here and to um, get set up with their, um, what they're gonna use for their media. And then um, finally, um, Susan Keefe and the people that help us schedule spaces. So just so you all know, there's a lot of infrastructure behind this and we just wanna thank those people. Thanks for clapping. <laughs> and me. <laughs> um, <laughs> awkward. Um, so I'm going to introduce Margot Kwan Knight. Um, she is, has, um, I'm going to go start with where she went to school. She has a BA from Dartmouth and an MFA from Bard. Um, and then she also studied at, at the photo department in Fabrica in Villorba, Italy. Um, she works mostly, she works around the medium of photography and video, which a lot of us think about not, you know, I work around the medium of painting, which is about its relationship to a particular history, but it doesn't only reside in that medium, it's also responding to photography, video, technology, all kinds of things. So I, I think of Margot's work doing the same. Um, she has, it's been featured in over 70 international publications. She's exhibited um, at Gas Art Gallery in Turin, Italy, 9-11 Media Arts in Seattle, which is no longer, California State University in Chico, Centre Pompidou in Paris, Kunst Gallery, Galleria Museo in um, Bolsano, Italy, the Dotmoff Festival in Sapporo, Japan, um, Randall Scott Gallery in DC, Gallery for Culture, Soil, James Harris, lots and lots of places. Um, so she sort of looks, like I was saying about photography, the, the potential of photography to push beyond sort of fixed events or actual objects in time. Um, and looking at, she, also, she tends to look at sort of 
um, its use as communication and a relationship with technology. Um, Jen Graves wrote about a show she had um, at James Harris Gallery that um, Margot's work had no interest in ranking photography, only exploring the effects they have on us and the ways we use and need them. The work wants to make a photo photograph that is unfinished. What's unfinished can't quite ever die. So let's welcome Margot. Thanks, Joff, for inviting me here. I'm really excited to be down here. This is my first visit to Evergreen. Um, so really excited to talk with you guys today. Um, oh, here we go. Let me log in and get, get my PowerPoint up. All right, that's my name. Here we go. Uh, I want to talk about transformation today. I think I remember back, you know, a million years ago when I was in school too, and um, it was such a time of transformation, you know, discovering what are all these different subjects, which one am I interested in, what am I going to do with my life, um, and I'm still in that same space, and you probably will be for a really long time, um, even though it's very front and center right now for you. And the cool thing about art is that it leaves a visual record, you know, ripples in the water of that transformation that you go through. So I'm going to share, you know, a bit of my history, of course, leaving out a ton, um, but just, you know, see some of those stepping stones behind me um, and, and talk about, you know, life, life is so, uh, it's, it changes, nothing ever stays the same, and um, every person adapts in, in what they're doing, and um, I think you'll see that in the work. Uh, these questions have been my guiding lights as I've tried to figure out, you know, how do you do an art practice um, or make a life or figure out, you know, how to balance things out. And so I'm always asking myself at the start of every project, as well as just in terms of broader life, what do I care about right now? And how do I want to spend my time? Because life is so short. You know, of course there are bills to pay and all of that, but the driving force, you know, if you're going to spend eight hours a day for five days a week or even more doing something, you know, make it worth your while, right? So I, I was really focused on that um, as well as when I start a project, I literally sit down with a piece of paper and list, what do I care about right now? You know, or who, or what issues, or what's coming up in the news, or you know, what's happening in my personal life. And it's okay to put those things into your practice. Um, art is very accepting of all those outside influences. Um, and then later, I thought about how do I make that possible? Okay, is it you know, part-time jobs? Is it grants? Is it gallery representation? All that kind of stuff. But if you answer the bigger questions first, um, then you know what you need to uh, make possible. Uh, this is, you know, these are kind of dry, boring slides, but we'll get into pictures really soon. This is something you, if you do science, you probably are really aware of this kind of cycle of um, how you develop ideas or how ideas within a field get developed. And so I think about this when I'm making work, and I think about where I am in each part of the cycle. So anytime. I'm awake, hopefully even asleep. I'm observing the world and you know, seeing what's happening out there, letting in all of those uh, sources you know, that could be life events, but they also could be very intentional, you know, going to shows, going to um, see art in other places, reading critical readings, you know, what is the dialogue that's going on in my field, and just trying to absorb and observe as much of that as possible. And then there's a brainstorm time when I generate ideas. Um, and then separately from that, in the ideal world, um, it's another session to look at those ideas. And this doesn't all happen in a day. It's you know, a long, drawn out thing. You know, choosing which ones of these do I feel strongly enough that I actually want to put the effort into making them. And then I'll go to you know, actually get out a camera or a paintbrush or a pencil or whatever and start to make something physical. And once you have something physical in hand, you can evaluate it. Is this what I wanted? Maybe it wants something else that I didn't think of. Let me give it some freedom to do what it needs to do. 
um, and, and bring in other people to help evaluate it, you know, studio visits from friends or whoever, and, and try and figure out, you know, I made one step. Am I going in the right direction? Do I need to shift a little bit as I take the next step around the cycle again? So I feel like this is something that I use in my art life and also in my regular life of like, hey, I'm going to try out this part-time job and see if it's something that works for my life or that I'm interested in and then, you know, give it six months to get in there and then evaluate. Is that what I wanted? Is that working for me? And, you know, does my boss like me? Get that feedback from others and then, you know, think about the next step around the cycle. So I feel like this can apply in lots of places. Here are my quick tips for the more creative side of things. Um, I really think about the key is to start your journey without knowing where you're going. Because if you know where you're going, that's just propaganda, and it's also boring for you. Um, and one of the key things I've sought in my life uh, in terms of you know how do I want to spend my time is I don't want to be bored. And if I'm going to make the choice to do art, which you know, you're not going to get a ton of outside income for that. Well, at least I want to make sure I'm doing something that's super interesting to me. Uh, so, so not having that destination means it's going to be meaningful for you and then hopefully for others as well. Uh, staying open to changing direction. You'll see that as I get into all the pictures of, you know, a person changes and grows and, and the work gets its own direction and you just follow it wherever it leads. Uh, and then the other thing that I've struggled with, and I make this mistake over and over, and that's why I'm telling you about it, is um, invest as little as possible in an idea, which seems counterintuitive, but for me it's been really helpful because my tendency as a type A person is to check every T and get it you know, as just exactly how I meant it to be, and you really don't need to do that if you're on this cycle of iteration of trying things out. You just need to do enough work to see the idea and evaluate it. You don't have to get it all the way to perfection or, you know, you need perfection in terms of, okay, I can see it, but you don't have to go all the way. So, so go quick and go fast and, and fail early and often uh, is the takeaway. So now I'm gonna get into pictures and I'll start with where I was, um, like when I was you guys' age. So I was in college. This is like my friends who I did a lot of kayaking with. Um, and it was at this time in my life when I realized the power that photography had in our lives because I was living with a bunch of gals and all of them and all of our sisters, except for myself for some weird reason, maybe because I hung out with these people who you know, don't care what they look like, but all of these gals struggled with eating disorders and with body image stuff and all of our sisters did as well. And it was crushing to see these incredibly, you know, wonderful, intelligent, talented women all being, you know, subsumed under this awful power. Um, and so I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. I mean, there's so many sources, but photography seemed like one of them or one way through which that power was made visible. And so I started to play with how can I own that power for myself and use it to talk back? And so that was what I focused on in college was um, trying to construct some kind of defenses um, for the friends and family around me. So I, you know, started playing with advertising images and um, advertising is so interesting because if you watch TV, like watch the advertisements with the TV sound turned off, you suddenly realize what they're trying to tell you which is crazy. It's like there's an advertisement for shampoo and if you wear that, you're gonna be really in touch with kangaroos who are with nature and smell like rainbows and you know, it's just so illogical and weird. And so I started like, all right, if you wanna be weird and, and pull your logic out into this crazy place, like I'll pull my logic out into that crazy place too. And so like play with, you know, extending the logic um, to, to its natural conclusion or what they meant. So these were just, you know, fun things and I would paste them into magazines at the grocery store and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, just, <laughs> like it's so weird, right? Like what, what do those things have to do with each other? Nothing, but like somehow you can do that with the magic of image making. So I was really into that. 
Um, and then, let's see, what did I do next? Then I finished school and was doing PR at this place that is sort you know, I was trying to figure out, do I want to do actual advertising and PR or do I want to do this weird art thing? And so I got a job at a PR firm because, um, you know, you need to see what, what is it like in there. And if you even come in as an intern, you know, doing boring things, at least you can look up and see, okay, the, the more senior people who I'm reporting to, what's their life like and what kind of things do they get to think about? And is that something interesting to me? Um, and it really wasn't because at the end of the day, there's just a ton of event planning and brochure making and all of this stuff. And so the next thing I tried um, was this place called Fabrica, which is kind of communications-based. It's a communication art research center that's run by Benetton, which we know as sweaters, but in Italy they're like a multi, you know, giant octopus of a company that, you know, owns part of the highway system and, you know, does all these big things. So they have this art center where they bring uh, students from all over the world. You have to be under 25, or at least, you know, when I went you did. Um, and it was a great place. It was kind of like, do whatever you want, as long as what you want is what we want, which was fine, because what I wanted was somehow in line with what they wanted. And I continued doing that research with the human body and, you know, why women, you know, are f feeling these, um, this pressure. And so, you know, I'll mention here, like, one of my sources. My parents are both in the medical field. You know, I would come down the hall, and there's my dad watching some super gory video of, like, the inside of somebody's knee, and the, the person teaching how to do this new procedure sticking their finger in there and, like, pulling on ligaments and stuff. And I'd be like, gross! And my dad would say, now, now, the, the human, you know, finger is the most sensitive tool of all the millions of instruments that a surgeon has. And so this idea of manipulating the body to cure and to help rather than to harm the body um, was really central. And then one of my favorite books was my mom did pediatrics and she had this book of all, it was called Smith's Recognizable Patterns of Human Malformation. So it was all the you know teratomas and um, birth defects and syndromes and all of the ways that the human body is incredibly malleable and plastic and can come out looking so different than um, what we imagine as a, nor a normal body. And so I, you know, took that idea of the plasticity of the body into my work. And I was having a ton of fun. Like, it was just so much fun being there and getting to do stuff and having, you know, all these other people my age who were all doing their own thing as well. And I really developed my own visual language um, and, and my own... Uh, sort of thrust, which was to take emotion and make it visible in some way, or to use the body to visualize these forces or ideas um, that were happening on it. Um, this one was about breast cancer, which my mom had when I was um, in college. And I think, you know, it was just so much fun being there, but also um, emotions are sometimes painful and you know what do you do with that you can decide I like this book that I've recently read um, for my day job it's called Conscious Business Building Value Through Values and it's by this guy I think his name is Paul Kaufman if I'm remembering it right but he talks about you know you can accept things that happen to you as kind of a victim of like, oh, this crappy thing happened and it's all because of these outside sources and, you know, whoa, poor me. Or you can take a more active stance and say, this thing happened. Yeah, maybe 99% of it had to do with outside forces, but where's my 1%? Where's my point where I can come in and make change? And it's not about accepting blame for these bad things that happen. It's about finding a leverage point where then you can have power to make things better or to you know, insert yourself into the situation uh, in, an active, in an active way. And so you know, seeing sad emotions or feeling sad emotions, I felt like, OK, this is happening, or I'm feeling this, and it doesn't feel great, but I'm going to do something with it, A, so I can process it, you know, yay, therapy 
but but also so you know if, if this is real for me it's got to be real for others and how can I get into those emotions and and use them for something productive for myself uh, then I transitioned again from school back into regular life and that that was scary because it I think throughout my art time I feel like um, the what is it the you know, can I make art in a box? Can I make it with a fox? Can I make it in school? You know, and so I'm constantly going through that, like, I'm not in school, can I make it all alone? Um, now I'm going to another country, can I make it in a foreign language? You know, and constantly doing that, and um, after years and years of doing that and having that fear every single transition, you know, oh my God, yes, no matter what happens, you'll find a way, and I found a way, and so I was always anxious about those transitions, but you know, you get, you get there. Uh, and, and the way you get there is you go out and get into that observation mode and see, okay, I'm in a new place, okay, I'm in a new space. For, personally, what, what again, what do I care about? And, and I really spend a lot of time when I'm in that phase, you know, not in the midst of a making period. I really focus on absorbing and being out in the world. So this was a time, you know, I spent seven hours in this, um, museum, and there were these amazing paintings by Fernand Leger, you know, old things that have nothing to do with photography, but they had all these dismembered body parts, and that suddenly resonated with me because I'm always working on the, the body, and also because I used to do um, whitewater kayaking and always had my shoulders popping out, and I was like, oh my god, that's me, like, look at that dislocation. And so I took that and tried to bring that into my visual language of photography. So I, so I did things like this, um, which this is in the Skykomish River, not, not that far from here. Um, and I basically painted, I mean, the making of was really fun for me because it's so hands-on and this looks like all Photoshop and there's definitely a little Photoshop um, to get the color onto those objects, but the objects are all physical objects. So I'd paint wax onto myself for my, you know, relief helpful friend who's like, yeah, sure, like put hot wax on my body and I'd make casts and then make um, molds with plaster and sand them down to make these rounded body parts and then we'd huck them in the water and, and do, some, do some photos. So I was, yeah, did a, bun you know, a whole series of these all in different places about this sense of falling apart and fragmentation and, um, and I was looking again, you know, at all these different art sources from Fernand Leger to this is Jean Arp who did these, you know, amazing sculptures and, um, you know, just thinking about the human body. And I guess because of that work, I ended up getting picked up by a gallery in Italy um, run by a guy named Pietro Gagliardi. And he was a great match for me because he had an advertising background um, and he also weirdly had the... Um, the model that was more like an advertising firm of where you pick young talent and then grow them up within the firm. So instead of a normal gallery situation, he picked some young artists and said, I'm going to support you. And you know, you, so we had this deal where you had more stable income, you know, he, he would get to pick and have a lot of the work at a lower rate than you would normally um, get or give for a gallery relationship, but it had the stability aspect and it was an amazing thing that allowed me to make work not completely full-time, but almost full-time for like 10 years. And so that was an incredible gift uh, or lucky thing that happened. Um, let's see, then I moved, so I'd been in C San Francisco um, for a couple years after being in Italy, and then I came back up to Seattle and I was still kind of, um, you know, thinking about giving physical form to things or feelings and, and trying different ways. Um, started using less Photoshop and more just the, the photography tricks that already exist, um, like strobes. Um, this was in a homeless shelter south of Seattle. And this was based on a painting by Caravaggio um, called The Death of the Virgin, and I loved that because um, I went and saw that, you know, in a church someplace, and it was, I felt so in touch with what Caravaggio was trying to do because here he was taking a physical object. So there, so normally when you see a Death of the Virgin picture, I don't know how familiar you guys are with like 
all these old religious paintings. Normally, you know, Mary is on this cloud. She's beautiful and young and surrounded by cherubs, and she's going up into the air, you know, on this lovely cloud with flowers and rays of light and everything. But when Caravaggio did it, uh, he was, you know, a little bit more like a salt of the earth kind of person, and he went and found um, a, the morgue a dead prostitute's body and painted that, which was like, whoa, horrifying for all the viewers at the time. But the thing that he did that was uplifting, you know, above this very earthly, shocking scene um, of earthly mourning with, you know, people around mourning this bloated body, um, was this huge red cloth up in the air that was, you know, draped in, you know, and crazy. It takes up two thirds of the painting and it's this huge, I should have put a picture in here. Anyway, but that idea of like giving the object all the emotion and all of this, the spirit was, you know, very in line with what I was looking for. So really, I'm always walking around the, the world, looking at art, looking at things and saying, oh, that, I could have that in my visual language or like, oh, that resonates with me. And you just, you walk around and pick these things out of, out of, out of the world around you. And then I went and did my MFA at Bard College, which was really great. Basically, you go to grad school for art when you're ready to kind of take off your coat and the kind of work you've been making and the way that you've been thinking and just sh drop it and figure out, you know, what's underneath there and you have to regenerate yourself kind of from scratch, or at least that was the approach that I took. Um, let's see. And at that time, I was really freaked out because I'd had this, you know, near death thing of getting hit by a car while I was on my bike and the weirdness of time where, you know, things sort of stop or slow down when you are in that thing of like, there's the car hood and there's you and it's just still there and then all, you know, then it happens. And um, so I was really into time and thinking about time. And I also um, was getting really frustrated with photography because I felt like it couldn't, you know, I was, I was obsessed with death, like my own death, and then of course I'd project that onto everybody else around me, like they're gonna die, my mom's gonna die, my sister's gonna die, everybody who rides a bike is gonna die. Uh, and, and so I, here's what, I'll show you this two minute video that I made at that time. Let's see if I can get it to wake up. Wake up, let's see, option F. Here we go. So this is what I did at that time. Thinking about how photography can capture a person's life, you know, if I can hold on to them in some way. Get out of that. So that was me thinking about, okay, what can photography really do for me? You know, what do you got for me here, people? Um, 
you know, if, if we're all going to die and, you know, all I have left is this photo, does it, does it do the thing that I want it to do, that we want vernacular photography? Oh, sorry. All right. No, you're done. All right. Go away. Okay, here we go. Does it do the thing that we hope that it'll do, you know, to preserve a person or a moment in time? And I felt really frustrated that it didn't, you know, it didn't do it and I didn't get enough of real life into that flat little photo. And even if I took every single photo that existed in the world of my mother, say, because she happens to have a you know, lifespan that was really great because it overlaps you know, with the photography post-World War II, and it's black and white, and then grows in, an, as in adolescence into color. And then you know, she's digital by the end. And, um, and there's that bulk of bulk of images of a person, so she, her timing fit really well with like the history of you know recent photography as well as you know a person that I cared about and had access to their record. Uh, but anyway, I was super frustrated. Like it's not enough. There's not the real life is not in those photos. They're you know first of all only two minutes in the end, and all of them are smiling. They don't show any of the hardship or reality of life, and so. I spent the next, you know, whatever since then, number of years trying to squish more of real life into the surface of a photo. And so what I started with was, okay, can I somehow combine two images on one surface? And so I, in this picture, I'm using a projector to project one photo um, of a baby onto a photo of, of an adult. Um, and just seeing, like, can I compress time and, and things into one image that way? Uh, how does that work? And so I started making these, you know, a couple different works in a series that were about projecting video through photographs and sort of to bring the photographs to life. Um, so the setup was, yeah, the setup is there's a photo hanging, and it's hanging in the air, and then there's a projector behind it that projects a video of the same image, basically, uh, onto the photo. Uh, and so, let's see. I'm, I'm not going to show the video, but the idea is that the photo shows the eyes are always closed, and then the video is dark except when a car headlight comes by, which was really like my friend running by with a light. But um, and in the in the video, her eyes are open. You know, and she talked about you know, was, when you get to be a grown up, I guess you wake up in the night and worry about stuff. So. You know, I'm a grown-up now. Yay. Uh, but, but that was this thing of like, you know, she looks like she's sleeping, but every time the light goes by, she's awake, and it happens, you know, every so often um, in this uh, sort of eerie live photo. Uh, and then I tried, you know, a whole bunch of different ways to squish life into, into flat surfaces. So I took mirrors, and I etched the back of a mirror so that, um, you know, if I stand in just the right place, I can fill in my own image or you know whoever the portrait is of they'd fill in their own face so you'd see them aging on that flat surface i tried um a light box where instead of like a regular light box advertisement like what you see in the airport you know there's a picture and there's a bank of lights behind it and so i took that and then added a two-way mirror on the front so that you see the image in this case, it was a reference to this Italian artist, Pistoletto, who was famous for doing these um, mirror-like, tall, vertical uh, sheets of polished stainless steel that had then silk screens of people. So they looked like they were a doorway. And if they were in the gallery, it looked like you were seeing into another room, but there was this person. But his name in Italian also means uh, Pistoletto is pistol bed, which was weird. But so I just rotated it and turned it into some kind of film thing and um, you know where there's this so here's the picture but it's also a mirror and so you can kind of confront yourself across this thing like who's you know who's gonna win this battle um, and then another approach I took was trying to add a time factor into the photograph itself and I really love you know photographs are made of silver in the old days which is such an incredible material and so I took a big sheet of brass and had it silver plated. And then I silk screened an image onto it. But I, instead of silk screening on it with, with ink, I silk screened acid onto the image. And so there's no pigment on there. It's just that where the acid touched the silver, it tarnished it. And so 
uh, here's the final picture, and then the idea is that over time, the rest of that sheet of silver will also tarnish, just because air will eventually tarnish it and eventually obscure the image. So when I get an idea and it's really gnawing at me, I try to take, I often take the Helen Keller approach, which is like, okay, what is this thing? I'm totally blind and I'm gonna just feel my way around and try and get the shape of this problem by you know, getting at it with all these different fingers, which in my case are all these different uh, mediums. So, you know, can I, what, what with the mirror, what with glass, what with, um, you know, this, that, and the other, silver, all these things. So you'll see me do that a lot in these different projects. Uh, this was in graduate school. I did a, another project, um, an installation project, still about bringing life into a photograph. So out in the parking lot, outside the, the gallery space, I set up a bunch of mirrors, and they're like exactly, um, you know, like I found some crappy broken glass or whatever that was cheap, but they're, they're angled specifically so at certain time of the day they send a ray of light into the gallery door. When the door's propped open, they send it in, and then I've got another mirror propped up in the hallway, which then shoots that ray of light into, the, into my gallery space, and so I had this image of the sky, and then it would be illuminated by whatever the conditions were outside. And this was in upstate New York, so it was really fun, because in like 4 o'clock every afternoon, there's a massive thunderstorm, and so the clouds are racing, and the light in that room would just like go crazy. So I timed it to, to work for that. Um, but just trying, you know, all these different ways of how can I get more life, um, more of the world into this flat surface. And let's see, then I came back, you know, re-entering regular life. Um, and so I was playing again and t trying to take my, my advice of, you know, playing quick and fast and cheap. And so I'd be like in my parents' backyard trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. And I know some of you guys are in the, the course doing um, Northwest Coast art, is that right? All right, cool. Um, I love Northwest Coast art, and one of the things that is so amazing about it is what a constrained set of visual items you have to choose from. You know, you have an ovoid, you have a form line, you have, you know, whatever that shape is called that makes fins and wings and, and uh, those kind of things. And you can always add some claws and teeth, but you basically have very few pieces to put together. And yet, the incredible variety that comes out is is you know, amazing, and it speaks to that human creativity within a set of constraints. And so as an artist, you know, I, through my practice, have, have evolved into, you know, here are my visual items that I have to choose from, and how can I combine them in different ways and you know, add some claws and teeth as needed um, you know, to see what happens with that. And so um, this idea of reflection of glass surfaces, that's definitely one of the items in my toolbox. And so when I'm I was ready to play again. It's like, all right, I'll take a couple little pieces of, you know, mirror from Home Depot. They sell these little tiles and go out in the backyard with a camera and just see what happens. What's interesting about that? And so, okay, here's, you know, this is a picture of the glass surface and I can see through the camera that I can see like the laundry line. But then if I focus on the glass surface itself and like you can see there's scratches on it, then I see the surface but I can't really see the laundry line anymore. So it's really hard to see what the picture is of and what the picture's on at the same time, right? This is my continued preoccupation with this surface and how I can like turn it into a stuffed crust pizza and like put more stuff in there. Uh, and so I, you know, went through a ton of iterations. I'm not going to show you all that, um, but like building grids, cutting glass, like what can I do with this thing? And I eventually got to a place of turning it into a quilt where you can see the surface because now it has this very strong pattern and you can also see what's reflected on all of the pieces. And this is so, I mean, quilts and photography are so similar. You know, part of this idea came because I would use my parents' house as my studio a lot because they'd go to work and I'd come from my apartment and do stuff there and, where they had space and a wood shop and then I'd leave at the end of the day and they'd come home and I um, actually have never had a studio in my entire life except when I was at school for a couple months in the summer, and I've always had to make do with other spaces, but it's been fine. 
But so w walking through their house, you know, there's this, it's like, that's my, my heritage as a kid, right? It's all there. And this quilt on my parents' bed, you know, suddenly I looked at it and they have a quilt, you know, it's made of all these different fragments of fabric, like the curtains we used to have and, you know, somebody's jeans that wore out and, you know, the same fabric my mom had made bell bottoms out of in the 60s, like all these different fabrics that were part of our lives. And then up above the bed are all these photos of the family. And it's like, oh, there's that moment where we went on a vacation. There's that moment, you know, of the kids looking cute. There's that moment of that. And it's like, oh my God, they're the same thing. A quilt and a photo do exactly the same thing. They reference the broader life that's outside of that, that family space. And so uh, it seemed like the quilt was a perfect thing to turn into a photograph, or, or in this case, more like a camera lens. And so I would take this, this is my neighbor's house in her basement, so I took my quilt to like 20 some odd people's spaces, and um, okay, this is what I wanna take a picture of, is her space, and then I would set up my quilt in there with my lights and everything, and then I would actually photograph the quilt itself. So here's like the kind of image I would get out of it. Um, and it's on fabric, so it's really w wobbly and clattery, and I would stick a broom behind it to kind of pooch it out so it would avoid the camera a little bit. And then I would spend like three hours on each photo shoot wadding up you know, tissue paper, or toilet paper into little balls and sticking it under each piece of glass because each of those little fragments could face a different direction. Um, so yeah, up closer you see all these kind of fragments of this space and this person's history. Uh, and I was doing this at the time, this was 2008 when um, McCain and Obama were campaigning for president. And I liked the idea that this very American surface, the quilt, could go into anybody's house, you know, because they were always arguing about what are American values, what's, you know, America about, and here's a quilt like a camera that can have infinite infinite images pass across the surface, and none of those are definitive. Um, they just come and go. And so no matter whose house you take it into, this quilt you know, turns into it itself. Um, and it was, yeah, a lot of fun. And then as I was doing that, I'm also you know, thinking, you know, how am I feeling around this project? And I realized one day as I was walking up and down the hallway in their house, like, oh my god, it's happening again. There it is. Uh, there's their family photo sort of thing on the wall, and there's another photo down at the end that's getting reflected on those, and so those photos are turning into mirrors. I mean, there's so much written about photography versus, you know, photography as a window versus photography as a mirror, and that's a whole thing. You know, I'm not burdening you guys with all the art theory stuff that I was, you know, I'd always be reading at the same time as, as doing these. So I started, uh, I spent a year kind of being a moth and circling around the house, around these photographs that were hung on their walls in their house, um, just over and over, going back to them as time changed, as seasons passed, and photographing the photographs themselves, but with a mind to capture what was passing over the surface. Because we talk about a photograph as a, m a moment from the past, but you can never see the past as itself, you always see it through the present. And so instead of seeing this as a static object, I saw it as, you know, here's a moment from the past that is constantly hurtling forward through time to be with us in the present. And so we can only ever see it uh, through what, what's around it through, it, through its current context. And it was, you know, really fun to look so closely at these photographs and see, you know, sometimes it would get really crazy because you could see one and the other and, uh, um, and, and this is actually a, this is a shot of it in the gallery. This is an installation view. Um, so I framed it, you know, trying to frame it with the same color, you know, frame as shows up in the picture. And then also, usually you try and put um, non-glare plexiglass on the front, but I purposefully chose the really shiny finish so that it would happen again. And that as people put these in their own homes, it takes on that life again and reflects its surroundings again. So that was a whole series. Um, and then we moved to the United Kingdom, uh, to London, and how am I doing on time? All right, we're okay. Uh, and then I had, you know, the terror of, you know, can I do it in a box? Can I do it, you know, in the UK with no studio and just a kitchen table? Well, 
and no community. Um, one of the things I love about this area is the is the really warm and, and friendly arts community. I think that, you know, when I did kayak racing, it was a very friendly community because there's no money in the sport. And the same thing about art because it's like, it's not this competitive thing where you're gonna like get someone out and get this, you know, lucrative calorie representation or something. It's very friendly because of that, uh, for better or worse. But so here I was like, you know, feeling very alone. My husband's working like 80 hours a week. Um, and I was, you know, trying to meet people, but, you know, you're brand new, and, and I wasn't in an art school because I'd already done that. Uh, so one of my social lifelines was to use Skype and talk to friends and family who are around the world. And I started realizing, you know, as I'm using this just for totally personal means of like, hi, what's happening? That uh, also, this is a different way of using images than I've thought about in the past. Um, in the past, when I think about what we use photography for, I think about you know saving a moment, making a record, um, capturing something, and there's also a power dynamic that's usually you know inherent in photography and has has been a problem that many critics have have talked about. That here's the photographer who has the camera and has the the you know ability to decide how someone else is represented because they get to take that picture at the second and the framing and the lighting and all that. Um, and so there's this imbalance. Uh, and there's also been the sense of the camera as being very invasive, you know, surveillance, or um, if you wanted to get intimate photographs, you had to really get into that community. So um, for example, Nan Golden is um, a photographer who's really famous for breaking into this diaristic branch of photography and so she photographed her own people like in her community you know who happened to be um, in a very you know exciting uh, subgroup um, but because she could only take those kinds of pictures of you know people cross-dressing and doing drugs and living this very hedonistic life she could only get those kind of intimate photographs because she was one of the community and was super embedded within that world and and for anyone else to take that kind of photograph would have been very invasive. Um, so, so there's this sense of, you know, how can a photograph get in there without taking advantage of, of the other people or the people it's, it's representing? And so with Skype, all of a sudden it felt like all of that was upended. You know, this image is no longer to save, it's to communicate now. It's no longer a power imbalance. Both of us on both sides of the line get to decide how we look and we can see each other and we can see the other person. Um, and, and so this sense of, you know, when I even take a photo, of, like I'm in a store, hey, should I get this? And I send it to my friend, do you like this, you know, shirt or whatever? And it's like it's about communication so much now, the way we're sharing photographs. And so I thought, okay, that's a project. And I started taking pictures of people when I talk to them on Skype, you know, just taking screenshots. And I took thousands and thousands of screenshots. And it was so weird because normally when someone pulls out a camera, you know, the instant response, even if you're two years old, is, you know, you just put on your smiley camera face. Um, but on Skype with video, it was about the connection. It wasn't about, you know, that kind of uh, filter. And so I felt like, wow, the emotions that are coming through in these images are so direct. It, it was, you know, different. Because I'm not a street photographer type person. I could never get into people's lives in that way to take these candid shots in real life. But on Skype, um, it was all just, you know, landing on my laptop. Um, and so what I did is I started to think about how I could rebuild those images and use that source material, which often was very jagged and messy because of the um, pixelation that would happen, especially if there's a lag. You guys all probably have experienced that. So I started collecting um, broken screens, like broken car windows, and then I started to rebuild the pictures, pixel by pixel, and to embed them into the screen. So. Luckily, we were in an area of London where there were lots of source material. Um, 
you know, not a fancy part of town. And it turns out that there are different colors of glass on car windows. Like there's white, which is like really clear, and then there's slightly green. You can also get, you know, smoky, but that's harder to get a hold of if it's um, like a sunroof or something, or it's not just a tint layer on top. So anyway, um, I started rebuilding these things with just that very subtle difference between the light green and the clear, um, and pixel by pixel by pixel. And I would use this um, agar stuff, which is like really sticky, to stick each piece down onto the paper. And then you, when you glue them down, you can then just wet it, and the agar melts again, and it all the paper peels right off. So, um, so I'd glue them onto a solid sheet of glass. Um, and then here's the picture of it. So it was kind of like rebuilding a, a screen or the surface with the image embedded in the surface. And what I liked about it was that it was light sensitive. So if there was light behind it or like shining on it, all you could see was the crackles and you couldn't see the image at all. Um, but then if the light was from the front and more diffuse, then you could see the image um, coming up. So they were very, um, you know, very fragile images. And they were also incredibly laborious, like psycho OCD laborious. I think I listened to every single episode of This American Life that's on the archive. Um, but I don't know, I guess I had to do that kind of work at that time in my life because I didn't know what else to do with myself. And I've you know, I've always been a like, quick and dirty, like, let's get another idea. I like art because I can iterate in a week. But this took months, and, you know, that was probably dumb, because when I did go down a wrong route, it took months to get off of that. Um, but I was kind of buying myself time, like, if I'm doing this, then I can figure out what the heck I'm going to do next. So... That was that phase. Um, and then I tried a whole bunch of other things, you know, feeling around the problem again. So what else is light sensitive? What else is translucent? What else is impacted by light, um, just like photographs are? So I tried using um, a batik making tool to make dots of wax on paper. You know, if you're at a restaurant and you get a greasy spaghetti noodle on your napkin, it's suddenly it's, it's see-through where that oil is. So that was the idea. So the wax. Um, would make these oily spots that would be translucent. And then if I framed them with glass on both sides and hung them up in the air, if the light's from the front, it looks one way, and if the light's from the back, it looks a different way, kind of like how photographs go from positive to negative. Um, and there's a whole bunch of them hung up. Uh, and then another way that I was feeling it out was with paint. Um, and I loved how Shaw said, you know, I'm working around photography because people always say, oh, I'm a photo-based artist. And it's really, yeah, I'm a photo-based artist, but, you know, I'm not even using a camera for years on end. So I think around is a nice, a nice way to say it. So these are paintings. So I would um, recreate those Skype screenshots, you know, pixel by pixel with little dot dabs of paint. And the paint was clear. It was actually just varnish. Um, and so... Under some lighting conditions, you don't see anything at all. And then under other lighting conditions, the, the light would reflect off of that shiny paint, and you would see the image. And these were really fun to live with, because um, they were so like photography, uh, in that you have to wait for the light. One of my mentors was a lands is a landscape photographer named Joel Sternfeld. And so when I would go up to school to Bard, he lived in New York, and I would stop by and see him, and I'd stop by and see him on the way back. Um, and he, he had been friends with my mom when they were both in college. And so that was how I got access to someone like that, who is, you know, a father of, of um, landscape photography. And he... You know, sometimes I would call him and say, hey, Joel, are you in the city? I'm coming through. And he'd say, no, I'm in a field in Vermont, and I'm here with my 8x10, and I've been waiting for hours for the light to be right. I was like, whoa, you're a real photographer. I don't know anything about that, you know, but that's amazing. Uh, and, and so I was like, gosh, he's the, he's the real thing. Like, that's what photography really is, is you have to wait um, for the light and Skype was like, God, I have to wait for the sun to come up on the other side of the planet so these people I like will wake up and talk to me. And so I thought, you know, if I have to wait 
there's this thing about latency in photography, at least in the old days, you had to wait for an image to show up. And then here you have to wait even to see the image itself. And so I liked you know, adding that waiting in, into all the aspects of picture making and viewing. Um, I think this is a video that doesn't actually work. Let's see if it plays. Probably not. No, all right, that's my bad. Um, but basically, if you walk by, it's really cool because the light kind of rolls across the surface as you go by, and then they disappear again. And so I'd have them all when I was making this show. They were all around our apartment, and you know they'd be all white. And then at a certain time of day, some would show up, and it was like, oh, my people are here, hi, you know, hi. But you don't have to be here with you know looking at me all the time, which is nice. You know, see you later. So they were, you know, they're good housemates. Um, and again, yeah, you just people telling their stories from all over the place. Um, okay, then I had a kid, and this was another, you know, can I make it in a box? Can I make it when I have a kid? I was so terrified about that, like so terrified. Um, you know, but it, it was fine. Uh, but I also kind of, you know, killed myself making that show that I just showed you um, while my kid was really tiny, and you know, it was, it was not easy. I think if I did it again, I would be, you know, be a little kinder to myself and, and have a little more faith that, you know, you don't have to do everything right now because uh, of that fear. Uh, and then, so then continuing with this, this sense of invisibility and, and latency in imagery, um, I did a, sh a sh project where I photographed silhouettes of all of the women in my baby group who had become, you know, these very important other humans who I interacted with and spoke complete sentences with. Uh, while my my first kid was really really small, so this was in London, and you know normally like a a silhouette bust of someone is very important, famous, usually male, um, and so I thought okay it'll be these women, who we and all of us have babies, and so I took photographs of their silhouettes. You can see it, yeah, barely, um, and I silk screened the silhouettes onto clear plexiglass with clear varnish again. So this time you don't see it at all if it's you know, just in the dim light, but if you shine a spotlight on it, then the varnish makes a shadow. It casts a shadow onto the back. And so these were mounted you know, an inch or two away from the back of the frame so that, there was, so that shadow would be cast. Um, and so I did a whole series of those. And you can see like the, the actual varnish is just that little, like in the back of the hair, and this isn't me, this is another gal, but in the back of the hair, that's the actual varnish, but the, the black line you see around is, is the shadow. And then we came home, and I was showing with Soil. I was really excited to be home, and I joined Soil, which is an art collective in downtown Seattle, and it was really fun to be part of a community again. And I did a project where I kind of hypothesized, like, hey, I've got this kid. I don't have time to do anything for myself right now um, besides, you know, make, you know, make some money and take care of my kid and, you know, do family stuff. And so he can make the art. And since I made him, whatever he makes is kind of mine, right? So I did a show of his paintings. Um, and yeah, that was him, and he ran around the gallery screaming, mine, 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 which is kind of what every artist does at their opening. <laughs> so uh, he was two years old then. And um, yeah, so I wrote up a whole thing, and I interviewed him about you know what paint he chose and why he chose it and all that, and we wrote it up and put it in a, you know, in a little zine thing that went with it. So that was kind of fun, except then... Um, you know, since then when I've had other shows, like this one art critic in Seattle, who's, you know, more disdaining, will come up and be like, is this another show of work that your children have made? <laughs> it's like, well, may, you know, maybe, what do you think? <laughs> uh, but yeah, just soil's great, because it's a place where you can experiment and do things that aren't your normal thing, and, and you know, you're not trying to make a jillion bucks out of your show there, or which I never do anyways, but you really, you know, it's really, it's an experimental space, so that's what you're supposed to do there, and so that was a fun thing to do. Uh, and then I started this project called Synecdoche, which, of course, I didn't have a title at the start, but what Synecdoche means is a part for the whole. So if you say, hey, we're gonna, ha we got, um, how about this one? Our website got 
500 eyeballs. Well, it's like you're saying eyeballs, but you're really referring to a whole person, so that's a synecdoche. And photography is always a synecdoche, right? It refers to this other bigger whole thing. And so I started playing with um, the printing press, and I got access to this great um, printmaking studio, and I was starting, I started with putting garbage through the printing press, and like, wow, it comes out the other side all flat, and you can see a picture of it if you put paper on top, and that's so cool, and then I don't know why, somehow I ended up on doilies, and I got totally obsessed with buying doilies on eBay, which was unfortunate. Um, <laughs> but, and every time a package would come to our house, my two-year-old would say, doily! And it's like, I think I have a problem. Um, but they were so beautiful, and they were so much about women's work, and they were so disgusting. Because they were like, they call it a crew, which really means like brown. Um, and some of them were like from the Victorian era, and they've been stained by tea. Like they dip them in tea to dye them to cover a spot. And so like they're this disgusting like off beige. And some of them were like clearly made and you know, or it lived in the home of um, a chain smoker. So then when you'd iron them, they just reek of stale cigarette smoke. I mean, and the aesthetic is like completely the opposite of, you know, a modern taste. So they were really appealing to me because of all that. Because here's this, you know, epitome of women's work. Um, it's so like art in that massive hours of labor went into it, and yet it cost $5 on eBay. So there were all these things about them that seemed, you know, very in line with the things I was thinking about. Labor, um, women's work, um, things that, that are more beautiful in their representation than they are in reality, which is what photographs often do. Uh, and so for lots of reasons, I was drawn to them um, and, and bought too many of them. And so I would do different things with them, you know, feeling around this problem. So what if I emboss them into paper? You know, yay, a blind embossment. And then I got into foil. So I'd get extra heavy duty aluminum foil, which is so, you know, you use it in the kitchen, another women's thing. And yet it was unbelievable what would come out. Like just this, you know, thing that costs two cents plus a $5 doily, and you run it through the printing press, and it's like, oh my god, transformation. You know, that's what image making does. It transforms the object. Uh, and so I made lots of those, and they were um, really fun. And then I got into also taking photographs of them as uh, cyanotypes. And these are all one-to-one -one relationships, right? Like, there's no size transfer with an embossment. It's just the size of the actual thing that you squish it onto. Um, with a cyanotype, the way I was making it was the same. So you get this fabric that's impregnated with photosensitive material, and then you lay the doily or whatever object on top, and you blast it with UV light, which could be the sun, or it could be a, a UV light source. Um, and then anywhere that has been in shadow, that chemistry rinses out. And anywhere where the UV light has hit the chemistry, it hardens and goes through this chemical reaction, Fe2, that turns into Fe3, I don't remember, but it turns blue. Um, and this was really cool because it's like, oh, it's fabric again. You know, it's, it was fabric and it's become fabric. And the first photography book that was ever made was made by a woman named Anna Atkins using cyanotypes. And it was a science book. So she took cyanotype silhouettes of all these different kinds of seaweed. Um, and so I thought, you know, this all seemed to fit together. And I made these, they were enormous, like this doily's um, five feet across, so that piece of fabric is like eight feet across or nine feet across. Um, and yeah, it seemed like giving a new life or a more beautiful life to these objects that were, you know, been demoted in the aesthetic hierarchy in our world. And I also collected stories about them. I didn't think to put any in here. But people have amazing stories, and they're all once removed because of our age. So if you ask someone, you know, I asked my coworkers, and I asked friends, and I asked just people I knew, hey, do you have any stories about a doily? And they're like, oh yeah, my grandma used to make those. So like a photograph, it's once removed from the actual maker. Um, and so I, you know, I felt so sad for these doilies that I'd find on the internet because they don't have any value if they're disconnected from the person who made them. And so I'd give them stories like each of the 
pieces had their own title that was a long story. And it'd be things like, um, you know, oh, my friend gave me this doily. She, w it, she brought it with her from Romania because when they left Romania, they were being persecuted because their government there thought that they were gypsies, and so they had to flee, and they stuffed doilies into the children's clothing because those were small, and they thought they'd be able to sell them and you know, have some money when they got out. You know, and other ones were like, oh, my friend Alex, my boyfriend, when he was only 21, he got his own apartment, and he decorated it the way his parents decorated their house, which means he had a doily on top of everything. And then his sister came to his apartment and was like, you know, you don't have to do that. So, <laughs> so they were fun, you know, anything from like these historical, like deep thoughts to like silly things about how our aesthetics have changed. Um, and they were just, yeah, really appear appealing. And let's see, I'm almost to the end here. Um, and sometimes I know when I am feeling out a problem, I kind of go too far and start crossing my arms over, or like getting repetitive or whatever. But um, I'm in a weird place right now because I'm not making art. And I haven't made art since my second kid was born um, almost, yeah, two years ago now. And it's very weird. And I'm. Um, not sure how I should feel about that, because it's been such a big part of my life for so long. Um, it's even weird to be talking to you now, right? Um, as an artist who's not actually doing anything right now. And what I think about is, what do I miss about art? What was the thing that it did in my life that was so appealing for so long, um, you know, and Hopefully, as things evolve, I'll be able to find a space for it again. But right now, it's not. Um, I just can't. It doesn't meet my needs right now. But I think that one of the best things um, about doing art was that it's a designated place where it's safe to experiment and to make mistakes and to fail. And you know, I think about that all the time anyway, because like, oh, here's a book that I'm reading to my kids, and. The guy says, it's OK to make mistakes. Everybody does it. That's how we learn. It's like, yes, that's how we learn. If you don't make mistakes, you can't grow. And you know, in my day job now, if I make mistakes, you know, somebody doesn't have what they need for a presentation or you know, whatever, it, it doesn't, it's not supposed to be part of the process. Whereas in art, you're supposed to make mistakes. You're supposed to try a bunch of things that don't work and then pick the one that does. And so it was wonderful to be in, an, in a part of the world where um, mistakes are not just how we learn, but you have to make them if you want to learn. And so I would you know, encourage you in your regular life to, to take that to heart, because it is um, something that in the rest of our culture, it's harder to find a safe place for that. Um, and so this last shot I'll show you is, I call these rocks of failure. And so I took all of the aluminum foil doilies, the, the embossments on aluminum foil that didn't work out, or oops, I dropped a box of them on the floor and they got all you know bent on the edges. And so I'd ball them up and just squish them and turn them back into a rock, which is kind of like what I imagined you know, they came from, you know, and grind them down and, and, and make them smooth and, and yeah, get them back kind of to their source. And they're really lovely objects, because they look like rocks. And then you go to pick them up, and they're nothing. You know, they're so light. Um, so I'll end on there. And I hope you, know, you can think of some questions, because I'm here, and we've still got a bit of time. So that's that. Hello. Hi. Really wonderful. Thank you. Um, I had a mentor a while ago who said whenever you meet someone who has an important career or a career, uh, don't ask them for their advice. Ask them the best advice they've ever received. So could I ask you what is the best advice that you've ever received? 
That's a great question. I think when I was living in Italy at that art center, um, I did a lot of cycling, because that was a big pastime over there. And I got adopted by a group of old geezers who were in a social bike club, and it was so fun. You know, they were all like my dad's age, but nobody my age, you know, I couldn't keep up with the guys my age, and there weren't many women who rode bikes. So I ended up, yeah, riding with all these old guys every weekend, and it was great. And one of them, I mean, he was the guy who had like that white jersey with all the stripes on it. That means he's like an Italian champion for his age group. And so we did a crit one, um, one weekend when you go around in a circle and see how fast you can go around it. And he had great advice, because he'd lived through World War II. He was the guy who was like, I won't eat corn, because that's all I ate during the war, or blackberries, you know, because he lived on that, basically. Um, so he'd seen a lot, and his advice to me was, just keep pedaling. For, well, no, he started, he said, when you're in pain, just keep pedaling. That way, you always have the option to quit later. Thank you. <laughs> I have a... Uh, uh, hello. Um, hi. I have a less interesting question. I hope that's fine. Um, when during your professional career did you start using digital manipulation, like Photoshop? Um, I was still in college when I did, so it was weird because I, I guess I graduated from college in 1999, so during the couple years before that, you know, while I was in school, but it was a time when that wasn't really normal for the art department. I mean, even though at Dartmouth there were, you know, you could check email in the library, you could check it in the gym, you could check it anywhere, but the art department didn't have computers. And so my photo teacher, you know, let me get into the, the staff lab so I could use it, and he bought a printer, but it wasn't part of the thing yet. And then by the time I left, you know, they got a budget in place so that everybody was doing it, but yeah, it was kind of like batting around on my own at first. I see. Very interesting. Thank you. Hi. So you spoke about, um, with photography particularly, trying to bring life into a flat surface. And so the piece you did where you had the glass outside bringing uh, the sunlight into the gallery seemed like an experiment in bringing uh, life not just to the flat surface of, you know, the paint, the picture itself, but to the gallery space. And so I guess I was wondering what that relationship was like for you, if you thought, if for you bringing life to a flat surface and putting that surface in the gallery brings life to the gallery, especially as somebody who didn't necessarily have a studio space, maybe, you know, working in the home and so much of your work with, you know, in your parents' house and such uh, was in the home. And that relationship there, I guess, for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a fun project. And it was also sort of, I don't know, at, at art school, at least the one that I went to, it was really about, you know, p put up an idea kind of as shoddily as you can and then rip it down the next minute when you realize it's not, you know, going the right way. And um, I did a lot of variations of things that didn't work before I got to that thing. So, yeah, it, I mean, it was. It was lighting the whole space, just um, trying to make a space out of, a thin little, a thin little piece of plastic that has an image on it, you know, and can light go into that? And yes, it fills that whole room. Some of the other stuff I had in the room was I had just taken a piece of white butcher paper and taken a floor fan, and I mashed the paper on the fan until it took the shape of the fan, and then I just propped that up in the corner. So it's kind of like, you know, here's this room in this environment with like light and wind and all of this, and it's um, it's all kind of once removed from actual nature because we're inside and the light's coming inside from, you know, through this weird labyrinth um, of reflection and there's, you know, no wind in there but here's a thing that would make wind but it can't because it's a, just a sheet of paper. Um, so yes, I was definitely thinking about kind of the space as this environment um, that was all a little bit, f a little bit away from... Uh, you know, real outdoor space. Hi, uh, I was, so it seems like so many artists have to balance this, this 
reality that you need to make a living in a day job, but also have time to make your art. And I was just wondering like how much your day job and other day jobs that you had in the past, like do you look for stuff that can inform your art or are they just like always two separate worlds or I guess sort of like how those two things interact? That's a great question. And there are about a hundred ways to do it. And I've been, um, every time I meet an artist, I kind of am like, how do you do this thing? Because it is, it's like a really hard nut to crack. And um, in my case, I tried doing jobs that had to do with photography. And then I realized quickly that if I spent eight hours doing, you know, taking photos of products, for example, and then went home, the last thing I wanted to do was pick up a camera and take more photographs. So for me, just because of how I am, and it may be different for others, like I had to separate those. Uh, but I did have a very strategic list of say, I'm going to have my own business as an artist, you know, not God's gift to the lucrative business, but it's a business, and I need to know how to run it. I need to know how to do my own books. I need to know how to book travel and ship things from country to country. Uh, I need to know how to archive my work. And so I was very strategic about taking jobs. You know, I'm going to, you know, work for this, you know, gal and manage her office and um, through her get coached on how to do QuickBooks so that I can do books for her company and that will teach me how to do books for my company. Um, I will uh, take an internship for a couple weeks at a professional photo studio so that I can learn how they archive all of their f digital files and then I can adopt that kind of system on a smaller scale for my own work. So I was very, you know, always thinking like, yes, I need to get a job that um, is going to get me income, but also going to get me something to move me forward on this path to my goal. Um, I am interested, I think that you actually, from that last question, I feel that the, your work is very close to life, that you, um, you, you, you have, stay, you're low on pretense and you're low on theorizing, and yet I know you to have quite a bit of, of history and theory behind you, and I'm wondering about, um, so and so, I see your work is very indexical, very in the world, and also that indexicality has to do with the material itself. Um, and I'm, so I'm wondering about what you think the relationship. Um, for a lot of the students are working on on research simultaneously, trying to make objects or make things, or and and those two things can inform each other and be at odds. So I just wanted you to talk a little bit about your background in um, theory and. And history. That's a good question too. Um, yeah, I guess this talk I didn't pull up all my theory references, um, so I didn't know if they'd be of interest, but that's definitely a huge input as much as going and looking at other art or living in the world. Uh, reading theory and being part of a bigger conversation has been tremendously important and interesting to me, and so I think, you know, Yes, I've, I've helped run reading groups for many years so that I would have a chance, you know, to talk and read uh, and bat ideas around with another group of people who wanted to talk about that at that level. Um, it definitely, you know, who's your audience? Are you talking to a couple people in your small, tight-knit art community? Are you interested in the conversation of like where photography is at that's happening at a international level? You know, where do you want to play and who do you care about speaking back to? And I've definitely, you know, looked more at that larger, larger audience. Um, not that I think that my work necessarily will reach them, but they are talking about concepts that interest me and that I want to. Um, you know, throw my two cents out into the pot 
based on the themes that they're talking about, about materiality, about you know the role of photography now, which is changing, and of course this discipline is having a major crisis constantly of like, like painting did, of are we still relevant? And now photography is like, where are we? We're 5,000 things spread all over every discipline. Um, where's our heart and soul? Is it gone? Is it analog photography? Analog itself is going away. What's happening with that? So there's, um, you know, all of these things have definitely been tremendously important. Um, and I like thinking about them and I like participating on that level. Um, I was trying to think, you know, when you're making stuff, I just remember being in college and I was taking like painting one and I was learning art history of, you know, 1940 to the present and, you know, Greenberg said this and then somebody else said that and it was just like, ah, like I could hardly like dip the paint in paintbrush without being totally tied up with all the stuff I was learning about the theory. Um, and yet then now, when I read things in theory, it's so helpful, like they explain things about the medium or their concept of the medium that I can either say, well, that's total crap and I'm gonna make something that's exactly the opposite of that. Um, or, yeah, that really resonates with me and I, you know, I'm gonna take pieces from each strand. So, yeah, it's wonderful to have a relationship with that material because it can be, you know, it, reading it, you can recognize things that you're working on and so that's nice and then you can also absorb some of it, so yeah, it's, you know, I didn't sort of push this talk as much in that direction because it wasn't a f photo only audience, but um, it's definitely been a big part of my thinking. Does that answer? Um, I was wondering when you start with inspiration from like a broad kind of source like surgery videos or like you know like body image or something like that like how do you like file it down to knowing what you're gonna do with that like you know seeing like like or starting like you know heels muscle flex thumb on heel like you know stuff like that and so like um starting from the source and then figuring out like what you want to say or if the image comes before what you want to say or anything like that so I use a brainstorming process at the start of any project, and that may not be on a day, it may be you know, over weeks of, God, what am I doing? You know, I've just finished this other big project, the show's happened, now I have post-show blues because I don't know what the heck I'm gonna do next, and, um, what, you know, and that's when I sit down, I spend a lot of time going out and looking at stuff, and I also spend a lot of time sitting down you know, just with a pencil and paper, um, and then I start picking up materials as well. So there's kind of three input streams. Um, you know, playing with materials, materials that I happen to like, like shiny objects, caw, uh, and going and seeing stuff and reading and then sitting down and thinking about, you know, what's coming from in here. And so I do a brainstorm and in a brainstorm, you usually have a problem statement that you're pushing against. And I usually start with, what do I care about right now? And then you have the idea is to list out as many things as possible. You know, like fill the whole page or two or three pages. Don't worry about what it is or the quality of it or what's right. Just list it all out. Um, and then, you know, later you can go back and be like, yeah, that thing has been really on my mind. And you hold those in the back of your head as you're looking at stuff. You know, or it could be something unresolved from a previous project of like, that thing was interesting, but what about you know, this other part. And so I definitely do a series of brainstorms. And then when I get to something that's interesting, like, you know, this thing about this surface and, you know, the scratch was on the surface and I couldn't see the laundry and the scratch at the same time, what can I do with that so that I can see both? And then I start, you know, brainstorming on that and like, oh, I could try, um, you know, some kind of crazy lens that can see everything with an infinite f-stop or I could try, you know, trying to focus on the surface rather than the image and see, you know, I get all this blurry stuff. Or I could see, you know, try this other thing and then you go out and do those things and see which one, you know, is totally stupid and which one seems interesting or still confusing. So it's just this roundabout of, of, of writing and thinking and then doing. 
And you have to do both parts of it, because if you go too far writing and thinking, you know, what about actually, you know, you get so much from the doing, the hands-on, that cuts off so many options immediately, which is really helpful. Oh, Shaw, I was thinking about what you said, too. I went to see a show once of, oh, now I'm blanking on the painter's name. It was an old classic, classic painter and super famous, you know, in like a whole museum. And I remember seeing the work and thinking, you know, this guy was at the cutting edge of what was happening in painting at his time. That's why he's so famous and that's why he's got this whole show. And not being a painting buff and not knowing, you know, the whole history of that, like these are really incredibly wonderful to be in front of. There is color, there is movement, there is, you know, scenes of the circus, there is all of this stuff, and it's like I want to play on both thing, both fields at the same time, and I think the best work does, where there's something about theory and then there's something about the heart or common human experience and the the strongest work has a piece of both. My teacher at school used to talk about it in terms of being hot and cold, like theory's cold, and if you just have theory, it can get very dry and cold and kind of boring, and it's like a lot of squares or something. Um, and if you just have the mushy-gushy stuff, you know, what's the point? Um, but to have a little bit of each makes, you know, Goldilocks really happy, and me too. Hi. Uh, I couldn't remember how long ago the show of your child's art was, uh, but I was wondering if, you know, like in the time since then, um, like they had, you know, I guess developed feelings about that experience and like, you know, feelings yeah. about making more things. Um, I don't know. I guess just generally, what effect has that had on them, you know, as a growing being? That's a good question. Um, his, of course, his paintings didn't sell for millions of dollars. Uh, so he's got one above his bed, and he'll still go up to it sometime and be, and you know, when he was making it, it was not anything. But now he's like, that is Antarctica. And you know, go and, goes and points to a red blob. Um, and then he, so he, you know, he likes his painting. <laughs> um, and he likes drawing. He's obsessed with dinosaurs. He's five now and is obsessed with dinosaurs. But, um, you know, we just have a bunch of paper around for him to draw on, but it hasn't, yeah, been a huge, a huge focus for him since then. I let him take a camera, actually. I am kind of collecting his photographs, because he loves, he loves my phone and he loves Siri. Um, he and Siri have a really strong relationship. Uh, <laughs> although Siri apparently is, like, if you tell Siri mean things, she is spicy enough to not take that lying down, which is nice to hear. Um, you know, Siri, you're a stegosaurus. And she'll say things like, um, if you say so. <laughs> or she doesn't totally agree with you. But anyway, so he likes to look up images, and he um, likes to use the phone to take pictures. And so now I let him take my crappy point-and-shoot digital camera, and he'll take a lot of pictures of things that he finds interesting. And I find them really interesting because they're so uh, unfiltered and sometimes there's 10 of the, almost the same thing or they're super blurry, you know, all the things that look like really cool, you know, German hipster photographs uh, and yet they're by this five-year-old. So I don't know, maybe I'll do something with them eventually. But, um, you know, so many people have done that. Like Alex Soth is a documentary photographer who... I saw his work, he did a project that was commissioned in the Brighton Photo Biennial, which is in the you know, south of London. We went down to it, and um, Martin Parr had invited, was, was curating that, who's a big name in documentary photography, and he had invited Alex Soth to come and do a project, and so Alex Soth came with his family to also do a holiday, because Brighton's like a beach town. Um, but he didn't have a work visa, and so Bo Border Patrol said, you know, if you take photographs during this trip, you will be penalized and, and 
whatever, the, the full strength of the law, whatever it was. And so he said, fine, okay, I, you know, let's go. We've already got this far. We'll go to Brighton, but I won't take any photographs. And so he had his daughter, Carmen, who was like eight or 12 or something. She took all the photographs. And then he and she together edited which ones they'd put in the show. And it was a fun thing because, you know, um, it's kind of like click or pin the tail on authorship of like who made this work. We always talk about photography as being defined by the definitive click. Like that's the moment it's captured. That's the artistic ding. Um, and in this case, it was spread, you know, over time and amongst different people. And so, you know, he and other people have done projects like that where they've used their children to kind of um, ask questions like that. Um, and so I feel like that, you know, that's been asked already, but still there is something appealing about, about my son's photographs. I just don't know what I'll do with them, if anything, at this point. Thanks, everybody. Thank